Welcome back, Warrior Family. Woohoo! We are so excited for today's episode. We had an um, amazing conversation with a wonderful person, Melissa Diaconti. Mm-hmm. And um, before Abby recaps for us a little bit about our chat, let me let y'all know a little bit about who Melissa is. Melissa is a clinical psychotherapist by trade, astrological practitioner, intuitive mentor, and soulful business strategist. She's also the co-founder of Spirit and Soul Studio. Melissa specializes in helping women tap into their inner magic and access their limitless potential. Her mission is to help people manifest their dream life and business by cultivating clarity around their values, deepest desires, and cosmic blueprint and authenticity. She's here to help others shine in all of their phases, just like the moon. All right. So Abby, tell us a little bit about our convo with Melissa, AKA the moonful mama. Yeah. So I say this every week, but I mean it. This was a super fun conversation. Um, I definitely really enjoyed connecting with uh, Melissa. She's just, she is like this bright light and she just had so many nuggets of wisdom. It's hard to recap our conversation. Um, But you know, what I really appreciate is Melissa starts off with saying the best way to get to know me is to know my story. And I just feel like Mm -hmm. already that landed in my heart and I'm carrying that with me. Um, And then she shares about how when she was four, she experienced her first panic attack. um, And she lived a life of anxiety and ADHD without being diagnosed, right? And so without having that label and that diagnosis, her mom was able to really help her navigate this really challenging world in things like setting her up for success with giving her like times between transitions and everything. Um, But it wasn't until she was about a year and a half ago that she was actually diagnosed with anxiety and ADHD and could see how those weave through her life throughout her entire life and showed up in many different areas. Um, This conversation was really, really interesting because it's the first time we really dove a little bit more into ADHD and how ADHD and anxiety co-mingle and support each other (laughs) in living (laughs) this anxious ADHD life and how sometimes ADHD can cause anxiety, right? And so there's just a lot of like really great storytelling about how these things can come up in life and how we navigate it. Um, She also shares how she beautifully supports her clients um, when they're talking about their own mental health and how she really is able to companion her clients so they feel less alone. And she shares this beautiful quote, how we grow in relationship and we heal in relationship and how she applies that to her partnership and working with her clients and even with herself. And, And Melissa shares how she's just like learned how to ride the wave of her anxiety throughout her life. So this was a really, really great conversation. And it was just a really um, beautiful way of connecting with her because she speaks with like painting imagery in front of you. So you can really see her experience and what she's sharing. So this was, yeah, I really enjoyed yeah. it. So good. Yeah, it was such a great chat. Um, we cannot wait for all you warriors to hear it. Here she is. All right. Woohoo. Welcome, Melissa, the Moonful Mama to Anxiety Warriors podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to to be here with you and your audience and community today. Yay. Yay. We're super grateful that you're here as well. Um, So let's just dive right in. Tell us a little bit about your anxiety journey. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess the best way to um, to get to know me is to know my story a little bit, right? <laughs> like where <laughs> this all started and where it all came from. So Cliff Notes version is my very first panic attack that I remember was actually when I was in kindergarten. <laughs> um, um, it was um, when I was four years old. It was the first um, day of drop off at kindergarten. And I was literally hyperventilating on the floor. I remember this surge of adrenaline, like this adrenaline rush, this overwhelm. And I remember as a kid, not really, and crying, of course, you know, pretty intense separation anxiety for sure. And Mm -hmm. I remember that like having such a hard time as a little girl, putting words to what was going on in my body. And it's such an intense experience. And um, for me, transitions, even as a child, like my mom always had to 
I love, I thrived on preparedness and routine and structure. And so my mom always had to give me like 20 minute heads up, 10 minute heads up when a transition was about to happen. Even if we were just like going to the toy store, going to the grocery store, whatever the case is. So transitions were hard for me. And um, throughout my youth, as I got older, they became more um, episodic, you know, not really persistent or chronic, which changed as I got older for sure. <laughs> but, um, but as a child and going into like um, pre-adolescence and even adolescence, it was more just episodic, like triggered by certain social triggers or, um, events. Right. Um, also as a child, I should also, um, mention that I had a speech impediment too. Mm. Um, so I was in speech services. I had a really bad stutter, like really intense stutter. You would never know. <laughs> speech no. that worked great. <laughs> um, uh, and on top of that, I was also very easily distracted. So to be honest, I think for a long time, some ADHD stuff, more inattention, not really hyperactivity was always like borderline under the radar um, because I didn't have behavioral issues as a kid. You know, yeah. I was just a really bad student. I was a C student and I definitely believe in early intervention now, you know, especially being a clinical psychotherapist by trade, there's so much value in that. And I totally struggled with inattention as a kid. And I flew under the radar because I was just like this anxious little girl that was really distractible and inattentive. And I just flew under the radar because I wasn't fighting. I wasn't violent or like super, super restless. I was just easily distracted. Right. So that was the, that's like where my anxiety journey started when I was really, really young. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I have like so many questions. So I'm going to try, <laughs> I'm going to try to like, remember <laughs> all of them. Um, I guess my first question that I'm just curious about is, I mean, all right. My first reflection. And first of all, is that that was so cool that your mom realized ways to support you. Mm -hmm. Like transition periods can be really challenging for people with anxiety and ADHD and ADD. Although I know we've gotten rid of that label and it's just everything's ADHD now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't like that, but okay. <laughs> um, so the fact that your mom could pick up on that, right. And she kind of had to change her routine to support you in the transition is, is just so awesome. So that yeah. I just want to like reflect that piece. Yeah. Um, so my, my first question is, were you, were you ever like officially diagnosed with anxiety or ADHD or, and at what age, like, when did you have a label for your experience? So believe it or not, I didn't, the first time a therapist ever diagnosed me with anything pertaining to inattention, ADD or anxiety was within the last year and a half. Wow. For a wow. really long time. Yeah. And I would also say the reason for that is probably because I, it, I'm i very, I hate the word, but I'm very high functional. I, yeah. I have a very high functional um, presentation mm -hmm. of it. You wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Um, and thankfully, a lot of the tools that I've learned along yeah. my journey have served me really, really, really well, mm -hmm. um, which has been like so thankful and so grateful for that. But for a very long time, yeah, I really, this, it's this high functional presentation of it, which is almost more dangerous because you, um, your inclination to seek care and treatment yeah. is delayed because of that. Not just because of your own experience, like, oh my gosh, I'm, but I'm fulfilling my life roles and duties, but yeah. it's so freaking yeah. challenging, you know, doesn't everybody go through this, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I think, I think that's what led to, to the delay in mm -hmm. practitioners officially saying X, Y, or Z. I would love to, one of my goals, like my health journey goals over the next year is I would love to meet with a neurologist and like get some scans done yeah. just to kind of see what's lit up and what's not. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, it came later, later on in life. And like I said, I had this very high functional presentation even in college years, mm -hmm. like very high functional anxiety and, yeah. 
and inattentiveness. And um, it was more so in, you know, elementary, middle school, and a little bit in high school that it was more my academic performance that was mm -hmm. most impacted by it. And some social, some social relationships too. I can, I would become withdrawn and avoidant if my social anxiety was kicking in. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And, you know, I just, I think it's really, um, I, I always, I don't know what label I want to put, but, but I want to talk about labels. Cause I think that like, we don't have to be diagnosed with anxiety no. to know we have anxiety. Correct. Um, but yep. also like for me, it, it was like, it was like relief. It was like, Oh, <laughs> this is what this is. And yeah. so I just feel like, you know, like we don't need a label to handle what's coming up. Right. Mm -hmm. But also a label can support too. So there's like that duality. Um, yeah. I have one more question because you're like our first guest that's really spoken about the ADHD part. Yeah. Right. And I, I was diagnosed with anxiety and ADHD in my like early twenties but I primarily focused on the anxiety and missed out on the ADHD part. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit more about either the overlap or yeah. just a little bit more about the ADHD piece with anxiety? Yeah, it's, it's such a great question. And it's definitely under, I mean, even in my clinical practice, definitely under diagnosed for sure, for sure, even though the presentation is there most of the time. Mm -hmm. So what I think can happen is they kind of play into each other like a seesaw very, very nicely, in my opinion, because when you have um, this neuro mm, divergence, like when you have this neurological pathway within your brain that doesn't operate the same way as many, may, may, you know, many other brains do, so to speak, right? So when we're having anxiety, like anxiety ridden thoughts or we're having worried thoughts, sometimes that also plays into inattention because your thoughts are so scattered. They're going from bing, 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 one thought to another, one thought to another. And don't forget to, I, I have this very spiritual perspective on, on mental health too. So mm -hmm. even you know, people who, who I see and even myself who struggle with anxiety and inattention, we have this excess energy in our systems mm -hmm. and sometimes it has to like be expressed, right? Energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only move from one form to another. So sometimes people have to be restless and they have to move. And sometimes there's even this spin of agitation as well. I think there's some mood lability that comes into play there's some mood fluctuations that come into play as well. So I think when you're having racing, worried-based thinking, it's very easy to become distracted yeah. and not mm -hmm. be in your body. Yeah. And that's one, of, that's one of the things with ADD, like my inattention, I literally have monkey brain. And like, that's why mindfulness based practices have really, I think saved me many, many times because I'm creating these new neural pathways, every practice I do. And it's just helping me focus one at a time at a time instead of 30 at a time, because once my brain starts getting like that, the anxiety starts happening because I feel mm -hmm. like I feel the overwhelm. I feel the weight of all of those different thoughts and all of the different, um, like outcomes mm -hmm. of every single situation that's going on in my mind, which can be very anxiety provoking, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that's how they can interplay with each other. It's just this excess energy that doesn't know how to get grounded because yeah. our brains, how they're wired, they, they do that in a different way. We need different tools than other people mm. do, if that yeah. makes sense. Totally. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. I just, I love, um, I love the, how, or I just find it interesting how so many people didn't learn that what they had, right. Whatever the, it is that they experienced from a young age through mm -hmm. their youth, through their, even, you know, adulthood or their transitioning brain from like adolescent brain to adult brain, didn't know what the heck they were experiencing or weren't able to label said experience with one thing or the other. And like for you to say, after all of your years of 
training and, you know, living, right. That you just found out well, officially, right. Cause as Abby said, and I agree, you can know that you've had that you've lived sure. with anxiety totally. or that you totally. have trouble with, you know, inattention or whatever for your whole life without having being officially diagnosed by anybody. Sure. Um, but I just, I always find this part to be so fascinating, just like how many years into one's mm-hmm. life, sometimes it takes before these labels are potentially given to us. And I appreciate Abby too, what you, what you said about like labels can be helpful, but they can also have a negative impact as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know for me, and we've talked about this extensively and I'm sure we'll continue talking about it in our future episodes <laughs> that like, I've never been officially diagnosed with anything because I've never seen a um, mental sure. health professional. Mm-hmm. Right. So like, I just knew sort of instinctively when I had my aha moment during my, you know, when I had my first panic attack, which was years later. And then I found out, Oh, I've been dealing with this my whole life. And now I have that label and the label was helpful, but I didn't feel like And maybe it's because I learned when I was already older and like ready to seek more tools and support on my own. I didn't feel like, oh God, I wish I would have known this when I was five or 10. Cause it's like, I, I want to believe that knowing myself as I do, that I would have probably struggled with having that label be placed on me as a, as a child, you know? And so I just think it's interesting. I wanted to point that out. Um, So talk to us a little bit about the ways that anxiety shows up in your body, your mind, your behaviors, how it did show up or how it continues to show up. Yeah. So how anxiety or that excess energy (laughs) likes to (laughs) manifest itself is it always starts in my gut. Like many of us, probably I've had stomach issues pretty consistently (laughs) and persistently throughout my life. So gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, vertigo was, was a fun run a couple of years ago. Um, dizziness spells. I would get this surge. It was like this surge of electricity and adrenaline in my body that would hit me. And it's almost like, Oh my God, it's like knocks you over. <laughs> um, where it's, it's, um, you know, you, you get the hot flashes, my ears ring. Um, mind is racing, preoccupied thoughts, very fidgety, um, heart palpitations. I get a little palpy when that comes up for me. Um, and also the newest, the newest one to join the crew is some teeth grinding at night. Oh, that's good, old, good old TMJ. Um, so that's been fun the last year. Or so <laughs> Getting a million mouth guards fixed and fitted because, um, you know, but it's, it's also, I think a genetic thing too. Anxiety does run, um, in both, both sides of my family. So both my maternal and paternal line, we have a slew of yummy mental health stuff going on. Mm. So I'm like, Hey, if I got anxiety, little ADD to boot and some teeth grinding at night. Okay. (laughs) This is the cup I have. (laughs) Um, I love that outlook. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, but that's, um, that's, you know, how it, how it presents, um, in my, in my body and in my mind. Yeah. And, you know, so first of all, I feel like in some ways we can all relate, right? Like I definitely like before I was diagnosed with anxiety, like I had like, I was diagnosed with IBS. Right. And it's like, Oh, Same. Hey, why do I have that? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. And then it's like, Oh, wait, one wait, more endoscopy. Wait. Please. <laughs> yes. I know. I know. <laughs> you know. Me out of meditate. I get all, like, all these freaking medications. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's crazy. And, and so like, I feel like in some sense we can all relate to them. Right. But, but the other thing is just like going back to the just discussion about labels. Right. It's like, when someone gets labeled with anxiety, they might just think it's like sweaty palms and heart racing and not connect like, oh, it's my gastro, it's my teeth. Right. And so I just think it's so fascinating how everyone's anxiety and also ADHD manifests in different ways in the body in the ways it shows up. It's not like, a oh, you have this label. It fits this way. Yeah. And I think with the ADD component, I can be hyper, um, hyper organized and focused or the complete freaking opposite. I am so distractible. I have 
30 piles of unfinished tasks that I started that day. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. I, I, I just, I feel, I know. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking our lives. Yeah. um, And it's almost borderline like hypermania, like, yeah. you know, like you get this surge of energy and hyper focus. Yeah. Mm. And then the next day or the next minute, it's like, nope, nope. So you took on this big project, you mm-hmm. signed up for this big thing. <laughs> and then you don't have, you feel like you don't have the capacity to complete. Yeah. And then that's frustrating. And then that can give you anxiety because, yes. oh my God, I can't commit. Yes. Now my house is a mess and I started this project and I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> oh I'm God. just going to lay on my floor and scroll on my phone and feel super anxious the entire time. Yes. And I'm scrolling yeah. through. And of course my for you pages, like anxiety, mental health, TikTok. It's like, it's the most ironic kiss from the universe. It's like, here I am <laughs> surrounded by like my toddler, you know, needing something and then this unfinished pile of tasks. <laughs> and then here I am scrolling mindlessly for three hours on my phone. Yeah. yeah. Hashtag. Yeah, it too, it's, it's an avoidance strategy, but also a totally. safety and help myself strategy, right? Because I know. Exactly. exactly. Right. Like we've talked about yeah. how we need to sometimes clear and empty the mind what, with mindless scrolling or sure. yes, TV shows or whatever before you can of maybe course. get back to a task, you know? <laughs> but oh my gosh, so many things. I was just, I just had this vision of myself like where I was walking from one room to the other. And then on the way I picked up like four things I needed to do. And then like, I brought all these things to the other room. And then I was like, wait, but I don't, I don't have time for this one thing. And, and then it was just unfolded into just like, but all I needed to do is walk from one room to the other. And I made it into something way more complicated. (laughs) But you know, what's amazing. So many people, like I, I say that, to certain people to help them like explain why I feel anxious most of the time. And they're like, really? <laughs> like, that's how your mind works. Yeah. That's how my mind works. <laughs> and then I'm thinking of like four different timelines for those four different items that I carried right. into the room with me. Exactly. Like, and how I see it on the flip side is what geniuses we are. Mm. What brain has the capacity to hold that amount of information. Mm. So okay, I, I'll take I it. it on, yeah. I see it on the flip side as a strength, like the most innovative things on this planet would never come to be if people mm. who, if, if people who had ADD and, and anxiety didn't exist, those brilliant ideas wouldn't come to life because our brains work differently. They are yeah. wired differently. And I think it's to our benefit and to our genius if we so choose to mm. see it that way. Ooh, full body chills. Mm. Yeah, love because that. there's inspired thoughts that come in the same form that inattention would. Some of my best mm-hmm. ideas in my business that have changed people's lives came through in that form. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. it's it can be the most beautiful gift too. Mm-hmm. Frustrating as all hell, but it could also <laughs> be the most beautiful gift too. So, Hey, if I'm meant to channel things differently and bring things into form differently in this lifetime and in my life, so be it. As long as I have coping skills to kind of get me through those really yes. moments. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So next question, Yeah. you um, worked in the mental health field for a really long time. So, um, tell us about what led you to this work and a little bit about what it felt like to be a diagnoser when you mm-hmm. yourself at the time had often wondered about your own stuff, mm, about your such own a great, baggage. Love this question. So I was always drawn to helping people, always the natural helper originally went to school for art. Wow. <laughs> and then I went to school for art education. Cause I wanted to teach art. Mm. And then I started noticing as I was doing my observation hours in school that I was counseling the kids and not helping them do their art projects. <laughs> so I took my first ever um, social work elective class, fell in love with it, got married to it technically, got my undergrad master's, and then was a clinical psychotherapist for 10 plus years in the mental health field mostly. Did some medical placements, some forensic placements, um, uh, some 
uh, detention center placements, but most of the time it was geared towards like mental health treatment. And it was really, it was really interesting because I feel like when my clients would talk to me about what they were experiencing, we had this deep connection because it was like, oh, me too. Mm -hmm. Me too. So I think it was actually, it fostered allyship between me and my clients. Mm -hmm. I think it fostered trust. And of course, I would only self-disclose certain information if it would benefit the client, right? I'm not doing it in a reckless manner. Right. But um, I think it was one of my greatest gifts as a therapist. And I think that's what made me a really effective therapist in helping Mm -hmm. people because we kind of spoke the same the same language. And when they failed or they didn't have the words to put to what was going on internally, I had some language to help them express what was going on. Even if they were never taught that for a really long time, you know, I would have clients come into my office that they finally got diagnosed at the age of 60 and they were suffering their entire life. Right. Um, because of stigma and culture and even religious upbringing and just the lack of resources and support, yeah. you know? Um, so I think it was, it was one of the most beautiful, it was one of the most beautiful things. And I, I think I have a certain spin on mental health too, where I see this spiritual side mm-hmm. of people, this spiritual component. Like when I worked, when I worked at Pilgrim State, I'll never forget. I had to run a, I had to run a 10 a.m mental health treatment group for men with schizophrenia. Mm. So much fun. Let me tell you, (laughs) but they were one of the most, um, brilliant, intuitive people that I've ever met in my entire life, Mm. you know? So I think I I have this other spin on it Mm. too, which also gave them hope, you know, it didn't just put them in a box, you know, crazy. It's you're a genius. And mm-hmm. sometimes the world falls short as to not, like learning how to receive you. Right. So sometimes we get pinned with these stigmatizing labels that listen, can be a pathway and a doorway to treatment. That's right. good. We want, right. we need that. Yeah. But the other stuff that comes alongside it, that's not helpful. Right. You know? Right. So it was, it was, it was one of the most profound journeys in my life, being a therapist while also on my own healing journey too. Yeah. And you know, I mean, what, what, what you said is like, basically like, we're not taught this in school, right? We're not taught that much about mental health. Right. I think we had a health class, but like, I mean, this is messed up, but I just remember like in health class, we learned about STDs, right? Like we weren't taught about mental health and mental well being or any of that. And And so what I think is really beautiful for your clients, right, is because I think because we're not talking about it enough and we're not learning about it enough, we feel so alone in stuff like having chronic stomach aches or in stuff like having ruminating thoughts or obsessive thoughts. And we tell someone else about it and they're like, oh, that doesn't happen to me. And so as kids, as teens, as young adults, we're like, well, what's wrong with me? Right? Right. And so I think with your clients, it's so beautiful because- I feel like the first thing that's so helpful in mental health is knowing you're not alone. Like you're not alone with this discomfort, right? It doesn't mean it makes it better, but it does make it a little better. And then also with these groups, with these men, again, they get to be together. So they know they're not alone in their experiences. So I just, I love that piece. It's the universe. um, It's called in in therapy universality. Mm. It's it's this me too. Yeah. It's Mm -hmm. one of the most powerful dynamics and elements to a therapeutic relationship. It's realizing I'm not alone in this. And not that the therapist has to be diagnosed with the same um, issue, but just knowing that someone else is sitting with you in the energy of that is so transformative and so powerful. I I love to, and it's, I feel like it's probably going to be one of those things that like stays with me forever. So thank you for it. You said the world falls short of understanding you. And Mm -hmm. it's like, that is so powerful because so many people feel like, as we are always saying, there must be something wrong with me. If other people don't share my lived experience or the way I feel in my mind and body, then I must be insane. 
Yeah. And as a, and, and I just love the reframe that you, you clearly offered to, um, these clients, which was, no, it's your, you're a miracle. You're special. The world needs you. And it's actually the world's problem that they don't understand you, not yours. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like that, that's, yeah. that can, I'm, I can only imagine the impact that that must've had on some of those folks. Yeah. And even, um, I'll never forget. I had a 20, how old is he? He was, he was tw- around 20, 21 years old, diagnosed, diagnosed, um, with, um, with autism. One of the most like brilliant, like savants in music, in chess, in literary arts, like total savant. Um, but he obviously struggled with like social relationships and he would just express his frustration. And that was one thing that I told him all the time. It's just, you are so beyond this world that we don't know how to receive you. We don't know how to connect with you because you're so otherworldly and more advanced and teach us, teach us, teach us your ways, <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, it's true if we, and that's, and that's why I think reframe when it comes to anxiety and mental health is so key because We've heard one song and story for a very long time when it comes to diagnosing and mental health. And rarely do we honor the other side of it in the same weight, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. So um, I love this part of our call, Melissa, when we chatted a while back talking about this episode. Um, you told me that you see two different therapists for different things. One of them's just for you and another yeah. one is for you and your partner. So just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I like to think of, and I didn't really, I didn't seek out therapy on my own until after I became a mom, because I probably should have started a longer time ago, but you know, I was busy being a therapist, you know, um, <laughs> not that I didn't know the value of therapy. I did. I just think of it as going to get an oil change on your car prevention, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm you know, kind of accident insurance, right, too. But like, think of it as prevention. Think of it as prevention. Not necessarily, when, so, when someone goes for therapy for the first time, all of us have this, this idea that it has to be this whole big drama, drama-filled moment that leads to someone getting help mm-hmm. and getting, maybe they don't even use the word getting help, just getting additional support, right? I really like to see, at least in this point in my life, is it being prevention, right? Mm-hmm. Just like you would get an oil change on your car, you got you got to work on yourself, <laughs> right? You have to work on your intimate relationships in your life if you want them, if you want them to flourish and to grow. And thankfully, every single person that's close to me in my life has been so supportive of that. So nourishing and supportive of that. So that's how I see it. It's like, if we um, want to be the most fully healthy expressed version of ourselves, right? right? That means that I have to commit to working on that with myself. And also I have to commit to working on that with my partner too, right? Because we grow in relationship, we heal in relationship. And I think if we're in a committed partnership that showing up fully is one of the most powerful things that you can do and having the tools to do that, right? And also think of it as an investment, right? Mm -hmm. It's, and you might not see the return right now, right? On the good days, but on the bad days that, you know, you will. So it's also making a time and energetic investment that, you know, I want this to work. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. And I'm going to invest in that. We're going to invest in that because we we believe in this and we want to make it happen. I think it's just, we have to like, let go of the, the drama surrounding getting help. If it just, just, you see it as prevention, every single person, I think, would benefit from, from having a therapist to check in with, even if it's once a month, once a quarter, once a year, I don't care. Having someone that's fully objective that can help you see things in a way that you never have before and feeling Mm -hmm. validated and supported 
it's so good to be on the other side. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it is so good to be the client and just like feel validated and supported and be given all these different like solutions and tools that your mind maybe at first glance wouldn't think of. Right. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. I think that sometimes when we think about like therapy or getting therapy or seeing a therapist, it's like, and and to be fair, there's like a lot of hurdles, like to find the therapist because sometimes witnessing you and yes. Yeah. You know, you have to find the right person and yeah. And all that, but I totally agree. Like, like it is so worth the effort, even though it can be like an exhausting process at the beginning to find the right fit and know what you're looking for and all of that. But I, but, and then finding the time in your schedule, right. We all like have the busyness sickness these days. Like I can never find time for me. Right. And make the time. (laughs) Yeah. And that's it. It's worth making the time for it. Like totally. I'm I'm there. And that's prevention. See it as prevention. It's not for your good days. It's for your bad days. Yeah. Right. Yes. So good. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, in addition to therapy, what are some of your other, you know, go-to strategies and coping skills and techniques that have really served you in your anxiety over the years? Totally. So obviously yoga. (laughs) So I had discovered yoga and meditation when I left my previous religious experience um, practicing non-denominational Christianity in some very intense forms. <laughs> um, I had discovered yoga and meditation also around the same time when I started my social work career. Mm. So it was this beautiful blending of timelines where as I was experiencing this rise of anxiety, I was also discovering these tools to support me along yeah. my journey. So yoga has been amazing. Um, I also see, um, and have seen in the past a yoga therapist. So based on what's going on physically with you, emotionally with you, whatever chronic conditions you have, um, she would quote unquote prescribe, um, a yoga practice to do at home to address those certain needs. So she Mm -hmm. would blend like Ayurveda, some other beautiful healing modalities with yoga. So that was really, really nourishing and customized to like my needs, which really helped, helped solve a lot of my digestive issues too, which was amazing. Meditation, obviously. Um, And when I feel the surge coming online, so to speak, or my anxiety is really starting to peak and it feels like it's getting beyond that threshold, if you know what I'm saying, like borderline going to experience a panic attack. Um, I, I do distract my mind with some things in my environment. So I do some grounding stuff with the, with all my senses. Um, I like to change my focus onto something, change my orientation, change the situation, get out of the room that I'm in. I love to play with my dog. Who's also an emotional support dog, which is awesome. I love to do something calming. Um, but like, let's say, what was the last, the last one I had, it was a couple months ago, literally woke up. Well, it woke me up. So rude. <laughs> so, rude. <laughs> so rude. It woke me up at 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, hell no. Like I got to go to sleep. This mama's got to do stuff in the morning enough. <laughs> um, so what, what helps me is breathing techniques. I'll do that box mm-hmm. breathing technique. So breathe four. Hold, four, hold. So I'll do, I'll do those. Um, I'll do jumping jacks if I'm really dysregulated to kind of regulate my breathing if I have yeah. to. And I say to myself, in 10 seconds, it's going to be easier. Hmm. I just have to get through these 10 seconds. In 10 seconds, it'll be easier. So I self talk or talk out loud to slow the rush down. I just mm-hmm. once. Once I regulate my breathing, my mind and my body follows. It's just my breath needs to calm the heck down. Yeah. So it's this idea that control your breath, control your life. That's right. what I was always taught when it came to like my yoga practice and everything. So, um, and also in my birthing journey, it's like, that's one of the things that my doula kind of talked me through. It's like, how can you calm your breath down and your body down? And just remember in 10 seconds, it'll be easier. Mm-hmm. ride the wave mm-hmm. 
the peak is just, it's just peaking and then slowly, but surely it comes down. So that's been, um, really, really helpful for me. Really, really helpful. And I'll even set a timer. If I feel it like coming on, all right, here we go. Let's set the timer (laughs) for 30 seconds. Let's see how I feel in 30 seconds. Right. You know, so it's just like getting, just getting through that little block of time. Let me just get through these 30 seconds. See if I can figure out if the peak hit yet. And if it didn't, how can I make that peak freaking happen so yeah. I can start coming down? Does that make sense? Oh, 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, first of all, I love that, like, rather than like, I can't handle this. I can't deal with it. You, you choose to companion it. Right. And then I love the, um, the, the imagery of riding the wave. Right. I feel like that really is powerful imagery in like, right. This wave is going to end. It might be a big wave. It might be a small wave. It might be a bunch of waves after one after another, but at some point it's going to smooth down. It's going to calm down. And so you're just riding the wave and that, that totally, that all made sense. And then I just want to say that I feel like you're one of the first people to mention using like having your pets, right. As, as, as a coping technique. And I mean, I know Margo and I can both relate like, you know, we both have dogs. So deeply. We're very obsessed with our dogs yeah, <laughs> to a fault. Um, and they, and they're, they're great companions. They help anchor us into the present moment. They help like soothe our nervous system. They help us like, remember all the love we have inside of us. So I just love that you included, you know, oh, how, yeah. how effective animals can be too. Yeah, totally. And I it's love like- it's really cool. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I just, I was going to say that I really resonated with picturing yourself on the other side too. Yeah. It's like, you're picturing yourself when this moment is over, when this 10 seconds is up, when these 30 seconds are up, when, you know, that contraction is up. Although I don't have personal experience with that, although I do have endometriosis. And so I have, you know, there are certain experiences (laughs) yeah, that I have um, had over the, the last, you know, well, forever since I got my period as a 12 year old. Um, yeah. That like picturing myself. Right. And I love that part. You picture yourself on the other side of what it is that you're feeling, what it yeah. is you're experiencing in your mind and body. And it can feel very um, empowering to help you find that peak to get you over the hump faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And see it as also, um, it, I learned so much about my mental health and anxiety through my birthing journey. Um, because one of the things my doula coached me through is don't think of it as pain. Think of it as a sensation that's calling for all of your attention right now. That's all Mm -hmm. it is. It's just a sensation that will pass. Mm -hmm. It's just a sensation. It's just some pressure. It's just some extra thumps. It's just, Mm -hmm. um, and not to minimize the experience, but when you're in the thick of it and in the height of that adrenaline, you need to be as neutral and as objective with your language as possible to not give that extra emotional charge to like what's going on going on because it can just whoop, throw it over the edge even more. So it's just like, okay, it's just an extra 10 thumps. It's yeah. just a, it's just a shorter, it's just a shorter breath. Mm-hmm. Let's try and make it a little bit deeper, you know, in my lower back ribs, you know? Um, <laughs> so that's what I would say. And my dog, um, if my, if my office door was open, she'd probably be sitting on my feet. It's actually really, really cool. She, um, when she, she knows like intuitively when like, it's about to start like kicking up and she'll come over, she picks mm-hmm. up on it. She'll come over right up to me. She'll kind of distract me. She'll, she'll try and get my attention. And it's just the coolest freaking thing. They're so mm-hmm. much smarter than we are. Yeah. So much smarter. So intuitive. <laughs> yes. So good. Um, all right. So you could jump in a time machine and go back in time to mm-hmm. speak to younger Melissa. What kind of advice would you offer yourself? Mm. To, uh, to not care so much what other people think of you. Mm. Mm-hmm. Don't get caught up in the drama of what these people think because you don't even talk to them anymore. <laughs> 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 Who cares so about all these, all these people and these and these bullies, you know, I used to be, um, I was bullied as a little girl too. Cause I'm barely five foot standing at almost 33 years old. So imagine how tall I was when I was like four years old. Oh my God, I was a peanut. So I was picked on a lot for my size as a little girl. And 
oh, like I just so got intertwined, like entwined in that. Mm -hmm. But it's also developmentally, you know, when you're younger, you need to identify what other people think of you to help you form your own self identity. It's a whole developmental thing too. But um, oh my gosh, that's what I would Mm -hmm. say. Don't sweat it, sister. Don't sweat (laughs) it, sister. That's perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I think Abby understands something about being a a little vertically challenged. Yeah. We'll yeah. I'm five Are and you? three quarters of an inch. I haven't oh made five gosh. one. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's just, it was a thing. It was a thing, you know? Yes. It totally. was a thing. And yeah, vertically even, challenged. Even in, sure. like big groups and stuff. Like when I was a kid, always getting pushed around. So always being like uncomfortable being in large groups because you get yeah. elbows or backpacks in the face. Oh my like, God. A hundred percent. Yep. Resonation <laughs> station. Yes. There's an image for you. Backpack to the face. Oh, um, yeah. That's a good segue. <laughs> um, all right, Melissa, what does being an anxiety warrior mean to you? Mm. That no matter what episode is thrown your way, you got a shield and armor ready to go <laughs> mm. to, to handle it with grit, but also some grace. That's mm. mm. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Grit and grace. Double G. Grit and grace. Great. Melissa is the queen of like the genius one-liners. Yeah. We're going to have so many potential say. episode titles for this Heck one. Yeah. So <laughs> many. Throw my way. I'll give you some fun one-liners. <laughs> and, and imagery too. I mean, I saw Shira. Remember Shira? Has anyone? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. So the cartoon character Shira. So yeah. like with the shield and like the sword. I don't even know if she had both those things, but when you said like, you got your shield and sword, I was like, cheer up. Yeah. <laughs> grit and grace. <laughs> grit and grace. Yeah. So good. <laughs> Writing it down now. Okay. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> All righty. So are you ready to have some fun? Yes. Yes. We're going to get into some lightning round. <laughs> Hear their flashing noises because we're huge dorks. Okay. <laughs> so Abby and I are going to go back and forth asking you a fun get to know the Moonful Mama question. Mm-hmm. And you can take a pause, take a breath. You do not have to answer in lightning speed. So in your own time. Um, all right. So we're going to go back and forth. Abby, you want me to go first? Yes. Yes. Oh, see, sometimes <laughs> you're like, uh, whatever you want. Thank you for your honesty. Okay. You now, Melissa, I know how deeply in love with and connected you are to our amazing universe. So when do you feel the most connected to the universe? Mm. When I am lit on fire after helping someone like really change their mind, change their life, change their perspective. Like whenever I get those little winks from the universe or I get these little like like these little taps, as I call them from the universe saying, Hey, this is why you're here. Mm-hmm. I Whenever I feel really tired, I, I look at, I have on my phone, this album, I have my phone, this album of just like, feel good, like things that people have said to me about mm-hmm. what I do. And I'll just, I'll save them and I'll bank them. So mm-hmm. that's when I feel most connected. I love, I love that. Yeah. So good. Um, what is a quote, a phrase, a piece of advice, a one line or something that you've heard at some point in your life that's Mm -hmm. always stuck with you? Mm. So (laughs) this goes to my story of being like a little peanut, right? So if you ever doubt, this is how it goes and you can do the Google of what the exact words are. It's fine. But it's the idea and the truth that if you ever think you are too small to make an impact. Go to bed with a mosquito in the room. <laughs> that one, that one, and then the other one that my mom always said is you could be the ripest, juiciest, yummiest peach. And some people just don't like peaches. And that mm. is okay. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Okay. Mosquitoes and peaches. Mosquitoes yeah. and peaches. That's it. That's where we've landed on. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's what all that's you comes warriors to listening should take home with you right now <laughs> in your back pocket. Okay. Um, what is a song that always makes you want to get up and dance? And it can be like of all time or just like something you're feeling lately. Oh my god, anything Billy Joel. <laughs> Long Island girls. <laughs> Long Island, Billy Joel. Oh, um, Billy. 
and um you know like any sort of fun dance music that's mm. like popping right now I'm just like so here for it always always boosts my boosts my mood I would yeah that's what I would say for now for dancing yeah perfect yeah. or yeah. if I'm like in a mood Led Zeppelin all the way mm. I'm all an right. old school classic rock girl so that could always like flip my mood around too <laughs> I love that. All right. So then I'm going to, I'm going to riff off of Margo. So we know what your go-to is for like music right now. Right. But what is like a song or an artist you really like that is like embarrassing to admit? Mm. <laughs> guilty pleasure. Yeah. Guilty pleasure. Um, oh my Avril Lavigne. <laughs> <laughs> I love Avril Lavigne. <laughs> I love that that's a guilty pleasure for yeah. you. That is awesome. I don't know. Like that was like a first. Yeah, I freaking love it. I freaking love it. Even like me some old school Hillary Duff. Like, <laughs> oh my God. There we go. That's embarrassing. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I will totally. Um, I'm trying to think. I think that's, yeah, that's pretty embarrassing. I guess that's pretty bad. Yeah. I love it. No, it's so good. It's perfect. It's so good. It's perfect. It's perfect. Okay. Here I'm going to give you, I'm going to throw at you some like fast, complete okay. the sentence. Okay. Yeah. Love is sacrifice. Coffee mm. is yucky. <gasps> Ooh, so, so, so. Dogs are adorable. I've always wanted to become a millionaire. Okay. I feel, I felt embarrassed when I fell off the hammock at my crush's birthday party <laughs> oh. when I was 11 years old and he laughed at me. Oh, <laughs> oh my yeah, gosh. So brutal, visceral. Right? All right. Last one. I'm the happiest when. Mm. I am fully present and mm. just like having fun, like just being in in like play mode and being yeah. present, just having fun, being like my toddler. That's when I'm, yeah. <laughs> Greatest spiritual teacher awesome. of my life. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Last question. Um, I feel like those were so good. I feel like any follow-up is not going to be as good now. Oh <laughs> yeah. True. Come on. You got this. Okay, fine. All right. So if you woke up tomorrow, as a mm -hmm. mythical creature, mm -hmm. any, any, it could be like a unicorn, a mermaid, a centaur, Pegasus, like whatever. There's no right or wrong here. Yeah. Um, what would you be? Mm. And what is the sound that you would make as this creature? Oh, gee, I knew you were going to ask the sound. I'm like, oh, that was the that's... first part of the question. And here comes <laughs> the second part. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Um, a hundred percent, a unicorn, a hundred percent, a unicorn. And it would be like, doo -doo -doo -doo, like the, <laughs> the sound, like the, doo -doo, like, you know, the <laughs> Wait, like what kind of sound? Like a pixie dust, like a, uh, like a, I'll have to find it. I'll send it to you. No, you have to make it with your mouth again. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love it. Obviously I asked my mom five years old mom I should have known then I was like very metaphysical mom I don't want to be a little girl anymore oh. I want to be a unicorn and I want to be renamed PJ Sparkles oh, it's an amazing a name. name not joking because <laughs> it was That's like a good a name called PJ Sparkles or movie or show or whatever and I was like I don't I'm done I don't want to be a girl anymore I want to be a unicorn <laughs> It work that way. <laughs> I very fast about the human condition. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Love All it. right. So yeah. Melissa, tell everybody where they can find you, how they can connect sure. with you. Cause sure. I know everyone's going to want to. Yeah. So I hang out most on the gram on Instagram. So you can find me at moonful mama on Instagram. And I'm going to point you towards my studio website. So I can, um, you know, you can connect with us there, everything that we're doing. I'm also the co-founder of Spirit and Soul Studio, which is a metaphysical based healing center, learning center, gift shop. 
Um, so we have a virtual, uh, I guess you could say studio space and also a physical one coming in January of 2022 to Babylon Village, mm -hmm. New York, but go to spiritandsoulstudio.com and you can see all of the things that we have going on there. But if you just want to learn more about me, you can go to moonfulmama.com. That's M-O-O-N-F-U-L-M-A-M-A.com. If you want to see specifically all the things that, that I do, but to really tap into the magic, go to spiritandsoulstudio.com. <laughs> Perfect. And finally, do you have a win of the week for us? Mm, a win of the week? Well, I'm day three on potty training my three-year-old boy Woo! and we had less than 10 accidents today. So that is a win. Yes. In my book. Yes. I have a full-on meltdown in a puddle of tears today. So oh, far. wow. So, and neither did he. So <laughs> that's a <win>. perfect. <laughs> that win. is a huge win. That's yeah. incredible. That's, that's going to be a journey for you guys. Yes, sure is. That's for sure. <laughs> we'll hold space for you, mama. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And all the towels and, uh, Mm -hmm. you, so Lots much. of laundry <laughs> these days. I mean, I know, I know from all the moms in our lives, like how much laundry y'all have to go through is it's, it, it's mind blowing. So I yeah. can imagine that the laundry load will be a little bit harsh for a little bit, but you've got this. Thank you so much. Thank you. you got this. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so, so much, Melissa, for being a guest on our show. Yes. We loved getting to know you better and, um, look forward to hearing everyone, um, share all their, I don't know, joy out of listening yeah. to this. This was a, such a great conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh. This was such a fun conversation to re-listen to. I forgot how much I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many like tidbits and, and, and stuff coming up that like, yeah. I had to take notes a second time. I enjoyed it so much. <laughs> right. I feel like, um, first of all, Melissa is just so light and energizing something mm -hmm. about her energy, um, just makes, makes me feel warm and safe. Right. You know, like she just, she just pro projects like joy and understanding and empathy and just all the things you'd want out of, you know, a mental health prof professional. So it yeah. makes sense that she's, you know, has such an extensive background um, yeah. in this field. Right. Right. But also like the, the self-reflection piece. Mm -hmm. Right. Because there was something about just her being able to like understand her humanness, which sounds like that ripples out into her clients as well. Like her just deep understanding of what it means to be human and that you're not alone in your experiences, even if your experiences are your own experiences. Right. No, totally. Um, some of my favorite takeaways were just learning about how anxiety and ADHD kind of weave together. And these were some of the things that she shared were things that, um, I definitely feel like I experienced too. Like, I mean, we talked about how I never had a diagnosis of any kind for mm -hmm. either anxiety or, you know, um, neurodiversity in any real way. Um, but like so much of what I've read about ADD, what I've read about ADHD really speaks to me. And so yeah. I really feel like even without a diagnosis that that feels, it just speaks to me. I really resonate with so many of the I don't know if you'd call them characteristics of, of having that or, yeah. you know, traits of, of having or experiencing these things. So right. I, I appreciated and valued Melissa kind of, I think very effectively and, um, in a, in a relatable and understandable way, mm -hmm. explained how the two kind of commingle because like yes. sometimes the conversation, uh, you know, especially for somebody who's a doctor or, or in some, in some way, or a therapist in some way can feel very heady and I can get easily overwhelmed, like hearing about it or learning about it. But mm -hmm. I felt like she described it in such a way that I felt like I understood. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It was like relatable and relevant. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's so funny. Cause like in our conversation, we lightly said like, like, like she doesn't have the hyperactive part. Right. And so she might've been overlooked for so many years. And yeah. even when I was diagnosed with ADHD or at the time it was ADD, um, you know, the classic markers, um, <laughs> right. Are actually more presented in, in, um, in, the, in males. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, it hasn't been studied as much about hate, how ADHD presents itself in females. Um, but so many of the things that she was saying, like, 
Right. Since we're not like impulsively jumping out of our seats, yelling at teachers or running around the room, it's often right. overlooked, but that inattentiveness can be so challenging. And so just her like really focusing on how the in in inattentiveness one is challenging can create also anxiety, um, but also her reframe and how that inattentiveness can give space for really like amazing, beautiful ideas that we can bring to fruition. Like I loved how she shared the yes. realities, but the reframe also. Yeah. And she does that throughout the whole conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Just like instinctively almost. And I think that must've been a big part of um, her work as a psychotherapist and her work with clients, because it's like, we hear her say throughout the conversation while she's speaking about her own journey the ways in which that she either wished she would have reframed it for herself maybe, or was able to reframe it for herself and how she was able to look at um, so many of the things that were challenging as gifts in a way. Right. Um, and then be able to reflect that back to people that she had the opportunity to work with. Right. Yeah. Right. So interesting. Um, I definitely related to that whole like high functioning mm -hmm. <laughs> aspect too of just, and as you kind of just remembered that like, a lot of people who aren't running around the room, even as adults, right? We may have a million things swimming around in our minds though. Yeah. We still may, may not be able to focus on a single task because we're dealing with so much on the inside, but we have to sort of, and she said this, put out that outward presentation. You have to express yourself in a certain way, especially yeah. as an adult and a, and a professional, but like right. in all, in all areas, um, in all stages of our life. So I definitely related to that piece quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think we, we didn't necessarily talk about this, but I feel like it kind of was alluded to is we've all learned how to mask, mm -hmm. right? Like we've all learned how to present a certain way to stay under the radar yeah, as opposed to like really share our challenges because we just, we just didn't know what we were experiencing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I also, I really, you know, I enjoyed our conversation around the labeling and how labeling can be helpful or hurtful. And I really actually, my takeaway is kind of from what you said, where you were like, I don't know what I would do um, if I was labeled, you know, especially when I was younger. And mm -hmm. I don't know either. Like the, the thought that I had was, you know, would I have used it as a crutch or would I have used it as a way for self-compassion? <laughs> right. And, and, and I don't know. And that's kind of where I think like labeling can be helpful and supportive, or it can not be supportive depending on what we do with that label. Um, right. Or how that label is presented to us as children mm -hmm. too. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then how the people around us experience said label yeah, and how they, you know, their feelings around it or how they speak to us changes or stays the same, right. Based on, on a diagnosis of some kind. So, yeah. um, I, I really enjoyed the part of our conversation where Melissa talked about how, like, even therapists need therapy. Yes. <laughs> right. And how, like, she loved being the client. And I think that that's just such a powerful reminder for anyone out there that is interested in talking to someone or exploring mm. mo modalities of therapy. And she talked about yoga therapy, which is certainly different from talk therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that how many options there are couples therapy versus just for yourself um, to explore. And she, right. and I absolutely love the part where she was like, think of it as an oil change. It's preventative. Yes. Right. It's such great advice. Right. Right. And that everyone should get therapy. Like I totally agree. Right. Like where would we all be? as a world, if we all started like talking about mental health and like maybe even like group therapy in schools, right? Like we yeah. could normalize all of this and have coping right. tools and preventatives for the harder days. So true. So yeah. true. Um, you know, she also talked a little bit about, um, how not being present creates anxiety for her. And I know <sighs> we both had deeply related to that part. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved hearing some of her coping strategies for like yoga, tapping into her senses, mm -hmm. grounding and mindfulness. Um, and I really, especially felt so at home with the idea of reminding yourself what will be after the experience right. is done saying like this 10, well, it'll be better after this 10 seconds, or yes. what can I do to get myself to the peak a little bit faster? Maybe I need some jumping jacks. Maybe I need to leave the situation I'm in. Maybe I need to go outside, pet my dog. Right. There were so many, right. um, so many great parts to that part of our right. chat. 
Right. No, I loved that. I loved, I mean, I love the imagery of like riding the wave and knowing when you're at the peak and then knowing that, you know, okay, after that peak, it's going to start to go down and things will shift. I just have to be okay with where I am right now, knowing it'll change. And I just feel like, you know, that is, is such a powerful tool to have and to remember to do, right? Like sometimes we have tools, but we like, I know for me, I get super overwhelmed and I forget my tools. And I literally, Mm -hmm. like I said earlier, like I just lay on the floor scrolling on my phone. Like I'm like, oh, but then I could remember, oh, wait, (laughs) I have tools. I'm in the wave right right now and it's going to go to the other side and there's this other side to it. And just having that image was so powerful. Um, I really appreciated that part of our talk. Same. I think my, maybe my biggest takeaway was the way Melissa frames our, I mean, you and I talk so much about how our anxiety and our experience are our big feelings and understanding them is our superpower because it makes us more compassionate, empathetic, mm-hmm. right? To our own experience, to that of others. But I, I just love how she kind of looks at it as this innovative, creative genius as well. Yeah. And I think yeah. that was my biggest takeaway from her specifically. I think she's the only one we've spoken to so far that's kind of spoken about it in that way, that actually mm-hmm. my ADHD or my ADD and my anxiety, um, kind of contribute to me being so extra special, right? Right. So such a genius. And and she clearly reflected that to some of the people she got a chance to work with, who I'm sure felt really lucky that they heard that from her, from some, from anybody, right. Right. From somebody who's in the field. Right. And, and it, it goes to, Right. Is we don't see the genius in us because she said something like the world falls short of understanding. And that was like, that's it, right? We're constantly being told to fit in to the society that's being being presented to us and what it's supposed to look like and how we're supposed to look like in this society. And that's really where it falls short of understanding that we're all individuals with all totally different experiences. And just because I'm inattentive doesn't mean there's something wrong. It might be like, I have a genius idea. Like, (laughs) yeah, right. So, so good. All right. So warriors, we know that you got something fabulous out of this conversation with Melissa because she just shares so many just warm and loving and curious ways for us to pay attention to ourselves, right? And our anxiety. And so um, we're so grateful for Melissa and the fact that she came on the show. Yeah. Um, We hope that you love the episode as much as we did. Um, And Going forward, we'd love to hear from you, Warriors. Mm -hmm. I want to see your email in our inbox. If you want to reach out to us for any reason, you can find us at Anxiety Warriors Podcast on Instagram. You can email us at anxietywarriorspodcast at gmail.com. Share with us your wins of the week, topic ideas for us, things you'd like us to explore. Um, And if you think you'd be a wonderful fit as a guest on our show, if you have any kind of anxiety story that you'd love to share, get off your chest. Um, impart your, your own slice of wisdom. That's only yours to the world through our platform. Love, love, love to hear from you. Yeah. And we also would love it as we say all the time, as I say all, every single week, if you would jump on Apple podcasts, smash that five-star rating, leave us a review so we can find more warriors and add more warriors to our fam. And, um, we want to thank you for being here with us this week and every week. Yes. Yes. Thank you all so much for going on this journey with us. We're so grateful you all are here. Till next time.